let's look at the P5 players and haters. <laughs> That's right, because these five all-important countries have worked with each other sometimes, mostly worked against each other sometimes over the course of the last 60 to 70 years and have really impacted world events. And you've got to understand this stuff to get even what's happening in today's world, why the UN does some things and doesn't do other things, how some countries work together and are pitted against other countries. Now, of course, the P5, you certainly know the five by now, right? The United States, the UK, France, China, and Russia, uh, they are the ones with veto power, but the Security Council as a whole, the whole 15-member board, is charged with the keeping of the peace worldwide. I mean, that's its real main function. And in this respect, the P5 with the veto power do have ultimate authority over three distinct things that the Security Council is charged with. One, the establishment of any UN peacekeeping operations anywhere on the planet has to go through here, the P5. Any one of them can stop any peacekeeping operations. Uh, two, international sanctions. Anytime established sanctions are going to go down, it has to go through this board as well. And three, any real military action. If the UN is actually going to send people to go shoot other people, yes, that all has to go through the Security Council and the P5 has the ultimate authority to start or stop any of those actions from occurring on a global basis. Now, who works together to do these things or who blocks these things from happening historically and right on up to today? Well, as previously elaborated on, I mean, this is pretty much common sense, I think, for a lot of you. Uh, since the Security Council's creation in 1945, 1946, there really have been kind of two teams in play here. And it has kind of been broken down as the West versus the East, even though that's a fuzzy description. Because it's, it's only five countries, really. So it doesn't really represent the whole world. And it doesn't even really represent the West and the East. But having said that, for most major decisions and UN actions for the last 60 years, it has been the United States and the UK as one team, team kind of West, that have supported each other, that put proposals forward, that usually almost always support each other's moves at the United Nations. And the other team, of course, is China and Russia. It used to be the USSR before that, but China and Russia, uh, they have their strategic things that they usually, not always, but they usually support each other's things uh, at the Permanent Five. And these two teams have kind of played off each other and vetoed each other's stuff. And really, when you get down to the nuts and bolts of, is the UN really going to do anything uh, about a possible genocide or maybe Iran getting nuclear weapons or any of these things, it's really these four countries that have to figure out if something's going to occur. If the UN is going to take any action, I've said four, we know it's five. I've left out France. <laughs> the Frenchies always have kind of played a little bit of a, the middleman here, a little bit of the middle ground. They most often do side up with Team West. Come on, they are a Western country. So they're generally, for most things, in a menage a trois with the US and the UK supporting those Western initiatives. But not always. France has been very independent and vetoed lots of stuff that the US or the UK has put forward and teamed up with the Chinese and the Russians on quite a few issues over the course of time. So they play an interesting middle ground, but... I don't want to make too much fun of the French. It just comes so easily. But they do typically side up with Team West, but not always. Okay. Even this easy to identify general split, which really was exacerbated during the Cold War. I mean, right from 1945, right on up to the end of the Cold War in 1991, these two teams really, of course, vetoed anything the other side tried to do. So if the U.S. would say, hey, you know, we want to recognize Taiwan, China would veto that. Or if the Chinese say, hey, we want to absorb a Taiwan, the U.S. or, or U.K. would veto that. A much less bigger, grandioser things about, hey, we want to send a peacekeeping mission to Russia. Well, Russia's going to veto that. Neither they did, the Chinese would veto that. And the Russians might say, oh, well, uh, we think we should absorb Puerto Rico. Well, Team West is going to veto that. So you see how these uh, two teams have kind of balanced each other out. At the same time, not a lot of stuff has gotten done because of this. What thing in the last 60 years are these five countries all going to agree to do? And the answer, of course, has not been much. Now, even with that very generalized split during the Cold War, that's gone now, so maybe things have changed. Uh, there are some interesting exceptions that deserve a little bit more 
elaboration so you can understand how this stuff has worked. The first one I do want to point out is actually the very first time that the United Nations did anything. <laughs> and that is the 1950-1953 Korean War. Oh, that see, that still plays into current events because there's a divided Korea, North Korea and South Korea. That started uh, in 1950 when North Korea invaded South Korea. And they almost pretty much annihilated South Korea, but the United States, everybody thinks it's a U.S. war. It actually was the first United Nations war. The United States went to the Security Council and said, hey, we're, you know what? We're charged with keeping world peace. The North Koreans have just invaded South Korea. We're putting forward a resolution to say we, the United Nations, need to keep the peace. We need to go send UN troops there to stop this from happening. And indeed, it got Past. I know, it's crazy. Because you've seen you know, the old TV show MASH, right? Everybody sees MASH and Hawkeye Pierce and, and Hot Lips Houlihan. And so they're all American, so everybody assumes it's an American war. No, it wasn't. It was overwhelmingly American forces that fought the war, but it was a UN war. Crazy stuff, I know. But how did that pass? Some of you might already be thinking, wait a minute. I thought North Korea was a ally and friend of China. They are. And at the time, I thought North Korea was a semi-communist state who was a friend of the USSR. They were. So how the hell did the UN, how did the United States get this resolution passed through the P5? Because isn't it logical that China or Russia would have vetoed this? Yes. Good thinking. Here's how it went down. It's a funny story. You gotta remember, this is 1949, 1950, when all this stuff is starting to go down. The UN Security Council is still new. This is the first time they actually voted on something major, like action. So, why didn't the Russians veto this? I'm sorry, the Soviets, because the USSR held that seat until later, until it turned into Russia. Why didn't they veto this outright? Well, it's kind of funny. So the P5 the, and the rest of the Security Council sitting around a table in 1950 and the U.S. has said, hey, we want to do this. We're putting this resolution forward. We want to go repel the North Korean invasion. And uh, the Russians said, no, yet, 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 we're not voting for this. And uh, the, uh, the United States was uh, kind of uh, petitioning and debating and, every, and getting people all hot and bothered and they had a long overnight session and people are getting antsy and they've drank too much coffee. And so at one point the United States representative just starts kind of insulting the Russian one saying, ah, well if you don't want to go into Korea to save the South Koreans then your mama wears combat boots and she's ugly too. And you stink personally. We don't even like you. What are you even doing here? The Soviets shouldn't even have a seat here. And the Russian guy just started getting more madder and madder. Everybody's like, what the hell is this insult fest going on? And, and finally, the guy just got so ticked off, he just stood up and stormed out of the room. And as soon as he shut the door, the United States said, okay, let's take a vote real quick on whether to do this. Uh, a show of hands, everybody, yes, 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 passed. <laughs> That's how the Korean War got to be a UN war. Isn't that shit crazy? So a bit of sneakery skullduggery for one of the very first UN missions. But you might still be asking, wait a minute, what about the Chinese? The Chinese actually ended up helping the North Koreans in the Korean War. And this is not a Korean War history lesson. This is about the P5. The Chinese later went and helped the North Koreans in the Korean War. Why on earth did they veto this measure in 1950? Ha! Because that's a definite test question that I want you to know. China, the China that we recognize as China today, the big China. China, third biggest country in the world. China, second biggest economy on the planet. That China, that China that we recognize today didn't have the seat for China in 1950. I wonder who did. Oh, uh oh, oh. I bet some of you are really, really smart and you figured out that at the end of World War II, when the United Nations was formed and the Security Council seats were divvied out to the P5, that it was mostly the Western powers who made the rules. The United States and the UK and France, the victors of World War II, and they awarded China's seat to, ready, Taiwan. So, so the person that sat at the United Nations from 1945 right on up to 1971, was actually a dude from Taiwan. It had a little placard in front of him that said China, because the U.S. at the time recognized that guy from Taiwan as the leader of China. 
so that's how it went down. Back in 1950, when they took this vote on the Korean thing, the Chinese representative, a guy from Taiwan, was of course pro-U.S. And for the early decades of the U.N. Permanent Security Council, the Chinese a dude did mostly side with the U.S. and the U.K. Bizarre but true, and now you understand exactly how the Korean War was the first UN use of military force and how it got past the Ruskies, because <laughs> we tricked them, and past the Chinese who didn't really agree to it. It was a guy from Taiwan who agreed to that. Go ahead and jot this down too. That was the case from 1945 to 1971 that the Chinese seat at the United Nations and at the P5 altogether uh, was a dude from Taiwan. It reverted to the true China that we recognize as China in 1971. But at that point, for reasons that we'll go into at a later lecture, the United States and the rest of the world was like, dude, we can't keep recognizing this little dink island of Taiwan as representing the billion people who are in mainland China. So let's switch. Uh, let's give the seat not to a Taiwanese person, but to the Chinese person. 1971 is when that shifted over. And then is when you start to assume the Cold War stance of the Russians and Chinese mostly against stuff that the UK and US comes up with and vice versa. That make a little more sense? Uh, on this idea of shifting seats, let me go ahead and throw this out as well. Uh, the USSR, the Soviet Union, they held the seat at the United Nations for Russia from 1945 up till 1991. In 1991, the USSR ceased to exist. It dissolved, it went away, and Russia then assumed the seat, okay? Assumed the seat at the UN in general and also on the P5 Council. Okay, that's kind of the fun historic stuff. But we can see how the Security Council still does have this kind of division in more current events, namely in 2003 when the United States went to the Security Council and said, we're writing a resolution, we think the United Nations da, 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 should invade Iraq. Ah, that's right. Maybe you've already forgotten this stuff too. The United States said, hey, we don't personally want to invade Iraq, but we think they're bad. We think they got weapons of mass destruction and some other shizzle. And so we think to keep the world peace, we, the UN, should go invade Iraq. However, they weren't buying it, all right? <laughs> Most of the Security Council members weren't buying it. This is when Colin Powell, who was then Secretary of State, I loves me some Colin Powell. I totally would vote for him for President of the World. Uh, Colin Powell was Secretary of State. They sent him to the United Nations to, in order to convince everybody, hey, come on, get on board for this. Everybody knows Saddam Hussein's a bad guy. We all, as the world, should do this. Don't, don't make us, the United States, do it by ourselves, because you all know this guy's bad. Come on, get on board for this. Now, the United States knew, they knew, that the Chinese and Ruskies were probably not going to go along with this. They knew that going in. So why did they try anyway? Part of that same idea that I explained last section that you would want to kind of isolate and assholeate the countries who might stand in the way of legislation or resolution that you want. So if you can get everybody else on board, if you can get the whole rest of the Security Council to vote for your measure, but it's just China or it's just Russia that's blocking it, then you can make them look like real big assholes. And that puts pressure on them to abstain from the vote altogether. So that's what Colin Powell's trying to do. They were whining and dining everybody on the Security Council that year saying, hey, come on. Come on, Poland, vote for this. Come on, Turkey, vote for this. Whoever it was, I don't know who was on the, uh, the non-permanent members, but they were saying, come on, come on, everybody rally. And that way, when it comes time to do a final vote, the Chinese will look like real big shit heels if they stand in the way if we're all voting for this. Unfortunately, even before it got to that point, the Frenchies, ha ha ha, the wild card, they had already promised to veto it. They said, forget about it, dude. Look, Colin Powell, we think you're hilariously awesome, but we will veto this, we promise you. And when the French did that, both the Russians and the Chinese said, oh good, well we don't have to veto it, then the, the French are already going to do it, so we don't have to look like assholes. But those, all three of those members of the P5 said, no, nah, we're probably not going to go for this. Of course, the UK was like, okay, okay, let's go. Uh, Tony Blair, let's invade. How many troops you need? That's how that situation went down. Of course, the French because they promised to veto and the Chinese and Russians would have vetoed too, 
The resolution never even went to a vote, I don't believe. And therefore, the Iraq war then became a U.S. war. Remember, the U.S. pulled that off in the Korean War. They got the U.N. involved, got everybody to vote for it. That was a U.N. Uh, war in Korea. The U.N. vetoed the U.S. measure for the Iraq War, so the U.S. had to go it alone. Well, they had their coalition of the willing, whatever the hell they called it. But that is how the real world works, all right? Let's end with this. In today's world, given its history and the P5 players and haters, who hates who, who loves who, who protects who in today's world? A brief summary. This is not an exhaustive list. But, of course, all the P5 protect themselves from any UN action, and they protect their strong allies from any UN action as well. So, of course, there would never be a UN peacekeeping operation in Texas, all right? <laughs> or in Russia, uh, or in China. It's never going to happen because, of course, one of the five would veto that. But they also protect their allies. So the U.S. protects itself and its friends like Israel. So the U.S. and Israel are very tight, and that's why I know you've probably heard that there's been an ongoing 60-year conflict within Israel and Palestine, and you maybe you've thought to yourself, why the hell isn't the UN there? For God's sakes, isn't it the world peacekeeper? How has the UN not been involved in the Israeli-Palestine situation? Because the U.S. has veto power. The U.S. has stopped and blocked anything and everything that has to do with Israel from getting through the United Nations. And I do mean everything. Not just peacekeeping operations, but anytime there'd be a harshly worded resolution that just would say, hey, we think Israel were jerks for doing this, the United States blocks that as well. And they have and they will. So hopefully you get that. The UN will never do anything about the Israeli-Palestinian situation because the US and maybe even the UK and France would not pr would stop that from happening. So the US protects its allies, namely Israel and others. Uh, I'm just pointing out some highlights. Russia protects itself and its allies, mostly its former states when it was the USSR. So uh, Kazakhstan. Most of the Central Asian states have a strong relationship with Russia. So nothing is ever going to... The UN won't do anything there because Russia would block that. More importantly than even, say, the Central Asian states are uh, uh, places like Serbia, a long ally of Russia. And Russia has long protected Serbia, which is kind of why I've suggested that Kosovo may never become a state because Kosovo has been kind of pulled away from Serbia, and that pissed off the Serbians, obviously, but it pissed off the Russians who have the veto power to stop it. Now, that was getting even more questionable in today's world, but now you get why it happens that way. The Russians, of course, will also protect its new states it's helped create of South Ossetia and Abkhazia, which used to be part of Georgia. Ah, nebulous webs these folks weave. For its part, China always protects itself. Uh, and its allies, namely, and here's where it gets really sketch. And I'm not making fun of the Chinese. This is just the way it's worked out. The Chinese protect North Korea. That, that's why nothing has ever happened to North Korea since the Korean War, since China got its seat back in 1971. And, and you, everybody, uh, it wrings its hands about North Korea and worries about North Korea. And maybe we should invade North Korea. They're a screwed up, wacko, psychotic state with might have nuclear weapons. Shouldn't we be doing something about that? Nope. No, no, no. China is the big brother of North Korea. They're not going to allow the UN or anybody else to mess with North Korea. Worse than that situation, in my personal opinion, is Burma, a.k.a. Myanmar, a country with a military dictatorship which has for decades destroyed and killed its own people. And again, that might be an obvious one that you think, why the hell hasn't the United Nations stepped in there? because China is big brother to Burma, and they say, no, 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 you're not messing in Burma. That's our backyard. They're our buddies. Yes, they're brutal military dictators, but they're friends of ours, and we buy lots of goods and services from Burma, lots of, lots of natural resources, so no, we're not going to allow any UN action back there either. And you can apply this to another part of the world, Sudan. That's right. I know you've heard about the Darfur situation, a possible genocide that might have been occurring or might did occur in Darfur, Sudan. And lots of Hollywood celebrities and important famous people kept coming forward saying, we should do something about Sudan. We need to focus attention on the Darfur crisis. We need the UN to do something about Darfur. And can, can everybody remember what happened? Think, think, think. 
nothing did because China also protected Sudan. Why? That's not even near them. That's not in their backyard because China does a lot of business with Sudan, namely in oil. China buys lots and lots and lots, if not all, of Sudanese oil. The Chinese uh, companies have invested millions in infrastructure in Sudanese oil uh, industry. So China is not about having sanctions against Sudan or a UN military force invade Sudan or anything messing with Sudan. They are the protector. They protect themselves and their allies, Burma, Sudan, even North Korea. And of course, if you haven't jotted this down 10 times already, jot it down now. China is the biggest fan of sovereignty on the planet. Just protecting it to the death because they don't want anybody messing in their territory. So really, China really does not like to support much of anything against anybody any of the time, no matter what's happening. The Chinese would say, hey, Unless it's a state messing with another state, the UN has no business doing anything. That, that's really their bottom line most of the time. It takes some sort of real horrific action which can be proven to get China on board for any resolution. They, they always are the kind of the ones that are like, no, 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 let them do what they're going to. No, we can't mess with them. Ah, they're a sovereign state. Oh, so what if they're killing their own people? That's sovereignty. So the Chinese really are the ones who put the brakes on most things. And that kind of pulls us up to the last one I'll talk about to finish off this P5 players and haters. And that is Iran. I mean, that is the one that's the hot button issue of today's world now. Your time now. And maybe now after this play and hate us talk, you understand a little bit better the mechanics of who's been asking for sanctions against Iran. Again, most of the Western world thinks that Iran's trying to get a nuclear weapon and is maybe going to be threatening its neighbors and is a bad seed that needs to be controlled or sanctioned or possibly invaded. And the Russians and the Chinese, again, over there on the other team, they do business with Iran. So they are, have been very hesitant to do anything. Both the Russians and Chinese have said, look, you can forget about military action. We, we will veto the hell out of that. There's no way that China or Russia will support UN military action or even peacekeeping operations in Iran. They do, they do business with that country. They're not going to support that. What the United States has been saying is, okay, we understand you're not going to support a military thing. How about sanctions? Come on. And that's what they've been working on. Come on, we need to have sanctions against this country to prevent them from developing a nuclear weapon or do lots of other bad things. And the U.S., the core over here at Team West, has got the U.K., the lap dog, on board, but also the Frenchies. The Frenchies, in this case, do side with Team West. So this is a kind of classic example of how this division works in today's world with the Iranian issue. Team West on one side, the Chinese and Russians on the other much more hesitant to even do sanctions, much less military stuff. And that's kind of how it plays out in current events. And you will see this talked about as the Iranian issue continues to unfold and as other international flare-ups or possible genocides or dictatorships are called into question for the rest of your life of should the United Nations do something in this state or that state or the other state. Now you understand the mechanics, just in brief, of what might happen and what definitely won't happen, just based on, of course, the all-powerful P5.